from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up first, this week's cattle market segment with the Livestock Marketing Information Center's Caitlin McCulloch. Caitlin will share findings from her new analysis of the gourmet hamburger market, what consumers are willing to pay there, and what that trend suggests about consumer willingness to pay premium prices for plant or laboratory-based burgers. Also, K-State's Deanne Presley talks about damage done to crop field waterways and terraces from this year's heavy rain events and what you landowners should do to restore those conservation structures to a functional state. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee on why attempting to stock a farm pond with crappie isn't such a good idea. It's all here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. We're glad to have you aboard once again for Agriculture Today. The cattle market commentary for this week comes from the Livestock Marketing Information Center out in Denver. And the director of that center, Caitlin McCulloch, is along with us. Caitlin, a quick look back at the trade this past week. The fed cattle market, well, uh, not exactly a favorable run of it. Uh, Reportedly, cash fed cattle prices were as much as $5 off at some locations. Yeah, the fed cattle market continues to inch lower. We were seeing 104 for steers and 103 for heifers in the five area, grading over 80% choice. On a just basis, we were looking at closer to 170 for each of those. And on a head count basis, we were quite a bit below last week, but ahead of a year ago. Is this latest fall off in prices directly resulting from the downtime from that uh, Tyson plant as it tries to build back from the fire here a couple of weeks back? Well, what's interesting is that we haven't seen that much change in the weekly slaughter volumes. I do think the futures market on the Fed side is is overreacting a little bit to the Tyson fire in that anticipatory way of seeing issues with slaughter capacity. But if you look at uh, what estimated livestock slaughter did this week, we're actually only a 1,000 head off from a year ago. And so we haven't really seen that come through in the, in the data quite yet. So it seems, at least in the near term, that we're working through those cattle fairly well in the region, and we haven't backed them up. The steer weights continue to be below a year ago, which to me says feedlots remain current. And that maybe this move in the futures is is unwarranted. Particularly the October contract looks pretty low to me, but it continues to inch lower. And so I think we got to continue to watch these slaughter levels to see if there's issues with labor that starts to prop up, particularly as we enter this medium term. Possibly in the short term, we might have been looking at enough incentives to keep that labor force going, but... We've heard a lot of complaints about labor this year and in the past and just not being able to get enough employees to keep those chains running. And I think there is some concern that those employees will tire as as we ask them to do more. Um, So that could be more of a medium-term impact looking forward. But I think right now slaughter levels look good, and we've managed through this quite well so far. Well, as far as prices, it doesn't help that the boxed beef trade had a negative week uh, by and large, although that that part of the market has been doing relatively well up to this point anyway. We really saw the boxed beef rally right after the fire, and I think a lot of that was um, retailers being caught short with all the product that was potentially lost because of that fire. And so we saw huge moves you know, in the, the first, second, and third week after the fire. And I think this week coming back down, we're off about $5.50 a pound from the previous week. I think now we're just looking at where we've gotten to Labor Day and maybe that those demands and those shortages um, were really geared towards those Labor Day sales and features. 
And Caitlin, we wanted to look at something that you recently put together. It's a unique analysis of the gourmet hamburger market. Not sure we've ever brought that up before here on the broadcast. And you were looking at the demand factors associated with those gourmet burgers, and these have come onto the market relatively aggressively in recent years, have they not? So there's a couple of different facets that I think are interesting when we're talking about specifically the burger trend in the last couple of years. So when you talk about fast food, I think we've moved to, yes, maybe some more gourmet options, but the big trend in fast food right now is alternative meat and bringing on more plant-based products. Mm-hmm. Um, we see Burger King, a and both offer selections in reference to those. But on more of the casual dining experience, and what I mean by that is sit-down restaurants that are probably more family-oriented but aren't quite uh, white tablecloths, we've seen the price point for burgers climb fairly high over the last couple of years. Now, some of this is anecdotal. And when I started noticing this trend, um, I travel quite a bit to major cities and major markets, and we've really taken the burger from what used to be probably close to $10 for a burger plus a side to somewhere well over $15. Now, this summer, I've paid a little bit closer attention to this because um, it seems like nobody offers just one burger anymore, uh, right? It mm-hmm. is burger joints with all kinds of combinations and flavor and, you know, anything from different veggies to guacamole, fried eggs, bacon, ham, etc. I mean, you can basically put anything on a hamburger today. (laughs) But what that's done is it's raised that price point. I was in Denver, you know, I think the the gourmet hamburger starts closer to $17, and they offer them up to probably close somewhere close to $25 or $30. And that's for you know, your your burger plus probably some colorful additions to your patty, let's call it that, and uh, one side. Now, that's pretty expensive when you're talking about what a family of four would go spend per person at a casual dining establishment. So some of this is economy-related. It's attracting some of that discretionary income that people are able to spend. And we've seen that come through um, in the retail and restaurant sales data as well. So when we look at 2019 restaurant sales through July, they're up 3.8% over 2018. And June was up 2.7% just by itself. And that's been driven by largely higher menu prices. And some of that is what some of these trends that have become increasingly popular. Now, going through the beef supply chain, though, um, that's obviously added to the consumption of ground beef. And a lot of these gourmet places are segmenting themselves in different ways. Some of them offer branded ground beef. Some of them offer some type of elevated grind. A lot of them are using some sort of 80-20 mix. You know, it's not super lean, but maybe it's it's only ground sirloin. It's only Angus, etc. And so that has helped to raise this price point considerably. Now, when you look at the data moving back in time, we had a significant run-up in coarse ground beef From about 2001 to 2010, those prices were averaged roughly from 100 to 150 per hundredweight on a monthly basis. And then from 2010 to 2014, they ended peaking closer to 274. And part of that was we had an extensive contractionary phase in the U.S. cattle cycle, and so there was less of that beef available being ground. Um, And that was roughly from 2008 to 14. So we dropped from about 96 million head down to 88 million head in terms of inventory. um, And there wasn't as much supply available. We also dropped the trim supply by itself nearly a billion pounds less in that 2014 timeframe. Now, what we're seeing now is that that higher price point has come back and we are maintaining a much higher average price point um, than we had, and it's during an expansionary phase. So we're we're looking at coarse ground beef blends, $150 to $200 per hundred weight, even though we're continuing to grow the cow herd and we've seen above average levels of of cow slaughter. Um, And a lot of these coarse ground blends, I'm I'm basing this off a price that's only with steers and heifers. Mm -hmm. And so as we're expanding, that's higher levels of slaughter cattle available on the fed side. And during the contractionary phase, that would have been lower levels. So we're not talking about cow beef in a lot of these cases. Now, what that means is we've seen a price appreciation in a time that you maybe wouldn't necessarily think of it from a ground beef standpoint. And I think that bodes well for 
this food trend consuming quite a bit of beef in the marketplace. Now, the good news is I think this food trend's here to stay. It's not a fad. I have a hard time believing that we're going to go back to boring old cheese and bacon (laughs) only um, when we've grown accustomed to having such other options. But we're seeing a significant saturation of restaurants themed in this sort of light. But it is definitely a trend that is at large risk for recession, right? That would be one of the things that could really hamper this trend moving forward is folks having less money available to spend on fairly expensive hamburgers. Those are interesting observations, Caitlin. Before we let you go, I want to ask you, you touched upon this a moment ago, and that is these plant or lab-based burgers. What you found in looking at gourmet burgers, does that resonate at all with uh, what we might expect in the way of demand for those alternative burgers that are certainly priced at a premium? I think it lends itself to having the Impossible Burger and some of these plant-based burgers that are available today as an alternative. Uh, If you go to a burger-only joint and you do happen to have a vegetarian or vegan in your party, it's a nice offering to have for them, and it can still include a lot of the flavor combinations that are available. And so I think diversification is a lot of times key to be able to encompass more more of the population into this trend. Now, lab-grown products, I think, are still quite a ways off from consumer acceptance, and could we see those play in? I don't. I think that's less of an issue here because they're promoting themselves as identical to beef, and so, you know, what's that premium to say that your burger was, was grown in a lab versus uh, grown traditionally? And I think at this point, we've seen the Impossible Burger come in some pretty high premiums for plant-based. I don't know what that lab-grown product would look like, but I know from my budget standpoint, we're reaching the top end of where I'd probably want to spend on hamburgers. Yeah. Timely things to look at, given the changing complexion of the hamburger market out there. Caitlin, great comments. We appreciate them, and we will talk with you in a few weeks once more. Many thanks to you. Thank you. Caitlin McCulloch with us, the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll return in a few moments on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to This Agriculture Today. For the better part of Kansas, it's been an extraordinarily wet year. That moisture welcome in some respects, overabundant in others. One of the things that it has led to, though, is disrepair for our field conservation structures in a number of locations. And we brought by once more soil management specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Deanne Presley, to talk of restoring those and uh, making sure that those are up to their designated functions. And you have seen quite a few of these incidents of damage across the land already, have you not, Deanne? That's right. We've had some pretty tremendous storms this year. The intense storms are, of course, what caused the damage. So Those structures, waterways and terraces too, they are designed for a certain kind of storm. So the engineering behind them is, you know, so many years, so many hours type storm. But we've had some of the, several of those. And when that happens, sediment moves and they get rills and gullies that can form rapidly. So basically, sediment becomes a problem on a lot of these. Staying with waterways for the moment here. As a producer would go out and see this kind of damage, what should be their first response? Well, I would encourage a lot of people, I think it's good to look and see, look for signs of erosion. So how do terraces connect into that waterway? If they're kind of becoming, you know, orphaned, if you will, hanging above the the waterway, they need to be functioning. The water needs to be able to flow into the waterway properly. So that could involve removing some sediment if sediment's gotten piled up and it's not allowing the water to flow into this waterway. But also if there is some cuts or some erosion in, in the waterway itself, that 
that does need to be repaired so that it can then go back to how it was designed to function so the water can flow evenly across the waterway. So if one has those gullies or cuts, as you say, filling those with soil, then somehow assuring that that stays put where you place it because the next heavy rain might undo your work, right? That's right. I think after any dirt work of quote-unquote dirt work is done, whether that's in construction or whether that's in a, you know doing earthwork in, these, in fields, I think it's really important to either plant a cover crop on, even if you don't want to do it on the whole field, but doing it to protect the money that you've just spent on your dirt work is really, really important. And you can do it like a nurse crop. You can have a nurse crop of oats now and then go back and seed it later to the species that you really want to grow. So if it's brome grass or whatever, uh, I would have a nurse crop of oats now and then have the brome grass seed there again and just work on that. So just protecting the, the young plants. You want to plant something that will emerge rather quickly at this stage of the season. Even winter wheat would work for this purpose, right? That's right. Any of our fall cereals, winter wheat, barley, cereal rye, if you're, you know, if you're okay with cereal rye, if you're not in a wheat production part of the state, any cereal grass, triticale, yeah, those are all going to be good ones to jump up out of the ground, get some growth, and protect the surface of the soil. Part of the picture here, Deanne, is making sure that your waterway has adequate nutrient. Would this be a time that you would think about fertilizing waterways in that respect? I would, yes, but I'd also watch what the rain is going to do. So we don't want to fertilize the waterway and then have that get washed away, right. of course, too. So, But if they are a cool season grass, fertilizing them at the appropriate time for whatever the grass species is that's growing there. Some people have native grass waterways, too, and so thinking about when to fertilize those. But, yeah, they do need some fertility. Most people, I think, are top dressing those a little bit when they do the rest of the field. But it is something to think about. They can't grow on nothing alone. That's right. right. And we're talking in many respects, as you say, fescue or brome waterways. So this fall would be ideal for that or could be. Could be. And what nutrient analyses are required for these waterways? Heavy on the nitrogen? Nitrogen and phosphorus. So again, if it is a native grass waterway, they're really not going to need the phosphorus. Mm-hmm. But if I would say yeah, so checking the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium too. If it's in you know the southeastern part of the state, they they tend to need a little more potassium than say the western two thirds of the state. But and if in doubt, just a soil test, even of your waterway. I know that might sound a little weird, but a soil test could be informative if you haven't done it in forever, or if it's new property to you. I would suggest a soil test and see where you're at. Well, producers may be in repair mode and uh, caring for their waterways, but you point out in an article recently in the e-update newsletter that how one manages that waterway before the event makes a big difference in a preventative sense. That's right. Again, just checking them out, making sure there's not cuts or a bunch of sediment piled up too. If you think about any water, on any conservation structure, it needs to have the right shape. So if a bunch of sediment has piled up in a waterway down at the bottom of the field, going out and scraping that out at some point. Again, we're going to have to wait now. Probably most of the state has had such heavy rainfall again recently. We're going to have to wait till things dry out. But again, thinking about where you could put that sediment, there are places in the world where they literally haul the good soil that's down accumulated down at the bottom of the slope up to the top of the slope. Sounds crazy, but it could be done. But thinking about where to move that sediment. So scraping off sediment, filling in holes and gullies that have emerged are, again, some of the things that I would are critical to think about. And how one treats one's waterway, sometimes those are traffic ways for harvesting equipment or for livestock, and they will wear a path through a waterway. Those can also lend to vulnerability to erosion, too. Right? That's right. We should avoid compaction, definitely. So it is, of course, going to be the easiest place to go when it is wet is to go up a waterway or right. down a waterway. But yeah, they need to be protected from compaction, too. Deanne, let's briefly address terraces as well. They're part of the system, of course. A number of those were likely overtopped with these excessively heavy rains. So whenever the soil does dry out, getting in there and fixing those as soon as possible is in order. That's right. So they were all designed for some kind of height. So if it was designed to have 12 inches of height from the top of the terrace to the bottom of the channel. So, you know, then you can do that with a level and a board and just go and see level and a board and a tape measure usually requires two people. It's easiest with two people, but a level and a board and a tape measure. And you can see how deep is, is my terrace. And then you can, or how tall is my terrace, but how deep is my terrace channel? 
12 inches is probably a minimum for most, but it depends where you are, your soil type, and your slope, and also your rainfall intensity. So terraces need to be taller in the northeast part of the state. But I would say, you know, if in doubt, you could always go into your local USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service office because they do have technical staff that can help with some of these things as well in terms of helping you measure terraces. Also, they can recommend that if there are changes to the terraces. I mean, our farming practices have changed. So many of these terraces and water ways were put in in the 1950s and to be honest there are some people that will go ahead and change their terrace systems um people are taking out grass waterways and putting in underground tile terrace outlets and so anyway those are all things you can go into your nrcs office and talk to them about and they they can come out one-on-one basis to that field and help you come up with a plan but they can also help with assessing is this terrace eroded down and how much would you need to bring it up and so again Eyeballing a terrace height channel depth is something I, ca- I personally cannot do. That is that is something I'm not good at. You definitely need a board, a long board, a level, and a tape measure and just see how deep are we talking to make sure you have a proper depth. And there might be some people thinking, well, I've switched my practices. Again, I'm not doing tillage anymore. So if you've gone to long-term no-till, we'll usually get better infiltration and water will move into the soil. So do we need terraces? I would always say that it's good to have both the practices such as no-till and cover crops along with the structure. So the terraces, the waterways, ponds, they're there for these times when it just comes heavier than any soil can really humanly, you know, any soil can really handle taking that much water. They so complement each other. They're there. complementary. Yeah. yeah, it's good to have both. They're, the structures are there for backup. But yes, it would be great if we could get the infiltration rates of our soils up really, really high so that we can capture and store as much water as we can for when, you know, when we get a little short on rain someday, right? Which will happen. as we Eventually. Know. <laughs> if one is not making their system over, though, has a minor terrace repair, say, one has washed, has, Mm -hmm. uh, say, a slight gully to it. The old moldboard plow, if one wants to do it themselves, that still works? True, yes. So there are there are land improvement contractors that you could hire out. So I believe there's a Kansas Land Improvement Contractors website. Mm-hmm. So people that have belt terracers and different kinds of devices, of course, that do this for a living, box scrapers, things like that. But you can do plow up your own terraces again. Now, it's not going to be good for a while to do this but yes doing it yourself multiple rounds with a moldboard plow to basically move soil uphill you're trying to move it up to the top of the terrace so multiple rounds it's been a while since we've done any terrace maintenance demonstrations but usually what we'll do is we'll have a moldboard plow and we'll have somebody with a scraper and then we'll have somebody like a land improvement contractor that's got a belt terracer or a different you know there's just so many options so if you hire it out or if you do it yourself It can definitely be done. It's just a little time-consuming, but it is doable with a moldboard plow. Very good. But the last and maybe most important point, get out and see how your waterways and terraces have fared. Make sure that they're still in good order. And if you haven't done that in a while, it's probably overdue. Yeah. It's it's what I was actually doing this morning was out looking around at structures and seeing – which ones we're holding. And I think it's also a great time, of course, be careful of flooding, but it's a great time to go and look at the clarity of the water running off of your fields, too. How clear is it? How much sediment is in it? Anytime we're losing sediment, we could be losing quite a bit of nutrients. So trying to keep all the sediment and all the water on the field as much as possible, it's so good for the environment. And also, of course, it just makes common sense for farming. Great reminder and input, and appreciate you coming over, Deanne. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. And with some thoughts there on checking out your field conservation structures to make sure that they are in good stead, that's Deanne Presley, Soil Management Specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Do check the information out in a recent e-update newsletter out of K-State dated August the 23rd on maintaining grassed waterways at agronomy.ksu.edu. And we'll return shortly with more on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you and with today's top stories in agricultural news for you now, courtesy in part of DTN. Executives for major oil refiners are urging President Trump not to move forward with his proposed changes to the Renewable Fuel Standard Program meant to boost biofuel usage. The biofuel moves are meant to compensate for the EPA's granting of small refinery exemptions. The president is expected to boost federal mandates for production of corn-based ethanol and biodiesel in response to complaints from producers about the administration's policy of issuing a growing number of the refinery waivers. In the letter to the president, reading as follows the fixes that are being suggested by the USDA and the biofuels community that would raise the conventional biofuel mandate will do nothing to increase domestic ethanol usage, but will only give incentives for more imported biodiesel. That was signed by CEOs Joseph Gorder of Valero, Gary Heminger of Marathon, and Jeff Ramsey of Flint Hills Resources. The companies led by those three chief executives produced nearly one-fifth of U.S. ethanol. And the refiners also pushed back on the suggestion that ethanol demand has been undermined by those EPA waivers, exempting some small refineries from biofuel blending requirements. They say that notion is, quoting them, simply untrue. The USDA is forecasting an increase in farm income for 2019. Here's more on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA's Economic Research Service has released its August 2019 farm income forecast. Net farm income, a more comprehensive measure of uh, farm income, is forecast at $88 billion, and that's up 4.8 percent from 2018. Deputy Chief Economist Warren Preston says net cash farm income also is forecast to increase. Even though we have both net cash income and net farm income are projected up, actually cash receipts from commodity sales are expected to be down by $2.4 billion dollars six-tenths of a percent relative to 2018. He notes a few factors that are making up the difference. One of those is uh, direct government payments that we're expecting uh, to increase by $5.8 billion. That's up 42.5 percent from 2018. And commodity insurance indemnities to increase by $6.1 billion. That's an 80 percent increase from 2018. He says insurance claims are up because it has been a difficult planting year. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And USDA Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs, Ted McKinney, is leading a trade mission to Canada this week. He's accompanied by representatives from 41 U.S. agribusinesses and associations looking to expand sales to the U.S. top agricultural export market. McKinney noted this group is looking forward to meeting with current and potential customers in Toronto and Montreal to explore new and expanded business opportunities. On this week's calendar, once again, those water technology field days co-sponsored by the Kansas Water Office and K-State are set to go over the next three days, and there's one as well taking place next week, demonstrating the latest in crop irrigation technology. The uh, first of these this week will be tomorrow at Goodland at the Northwest Kansas Technical College Farms, 1.30 in the afternoon Mountain Time. Then on Thursday, two of these at Garden City GGC Roth Family TNO Harsberger Farms at 10.30 in the morning. Then Thursday afternoon at Hatcher Land and Cattle Farm near Liberal. That'll start at 5 o'clock. And the fourth of these will be a week from today at Troy, the Los Hills Water Quality Farm at 9 that morning. For more information, go to kwo.org. Now it's on to this week's Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some of the issues that we see on the feed cost side of our expense sheet on our dairy farms. As we look at feed costs and we consider the many options that are out there, We really need to work very closely with our nutritionist, especially, I think, as we go through uh, the next year or so, probably going to see a lot of volatility in the commodity markets, and that may result in some volatility in some of the byproducts that we feed, or it may not. 
I think it's going to be important to carefully evaluate if we are feeding some byproducts on the dairy farm, whether or not that's still a good buy. So when we think about byproducts that we tend to feed here in Kansas, those might be things like distiller's grains, corn gluten feed, maybe wheat mids, possibly uh, soybean hulls, whole cotton seed would be the main ones that we'd see on many of our dairies. We think about the more common types of supplements that we might be feeding like canola meal or soybean meal, those would be impacted by the volatility that we see in the commodities as well and uh, may reflect the current prices of commodities closer than maybe some of our other byproducts that we typically feed as a way to cheapen the diet. So, how do you evaluate all these things, and how do you evaluate it in your diet? Well, that's where your nutritionist really comes in. You need to pay careful attention to why you're including different byproducts in the diet. So, for example, something like distiller's grains, you may be including it in the diet as a source of protein and a source of energy. And normally, distiller's grains prices in as a source of energy very well as well as a source of protein. So it's one of those feeds that typically we do have a place in the diet based on costs that we might want to include it. However, when you start looking at some of the other things that we have in the diet, things like corn gluten feed, you might want to think about why you have it in there. Sometimes it is actually a good buy on the energy basis. Sometimes we use it as a replacement to stretch out, say, corn silage or other forages that we might want to uh, stretch on our farm. Sometimes we have some poor quality forages and it's a way to stabilize some things in the diet. So if you have really good forages, and particularly if you have an ample supply of corn silage, and you are including corn gluten feed just as a way to extend forages, well, maybe it's not so needed now for that purpose and maybe maybe or maybe not does it really actually price in? In other words, is it cheapen up your diet or does it make it more expensive relative to the forages that you might have available or that you might be able to purchase? So again, I think the next 12 months are going to be an interesting time as we look at fluctuations in the grain markets and that will impact our feed costs. So it I want to encourage you as dairy farmers to stay very close to your nutritionist, have conversations about the different products that you're including into those diets, making sure that they are still very cost effective given the situation that we have in the current grain markets. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to have some serious conversations with their nutritionist about feed cost. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today, and to round out this edition, our weekly segment on wildlife management. Aboard once again, Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Charlie, crappie are among the most popular game fish in Kansas and elsewhere, and you repeatedly receive questions, you say, from farm pond owners about stocking crappie in those ponds. But you point out that is problematic. It can be a difficult fish to manage, especially in small ponds. And if you're trying to manage a farm pond with multiple sport fishes, such as largemouth bass and crappie, you're usually going to find you have a hard time growing anything that's very large. And there's several reasons for that, and we can get into those. But primarily, the diet of crappie is very similar to the diet of other pond fish such as bass and bluegill. This overlap in dietary needs is not a problem if you have a low population of crappie in a pond, but crappie have a tendency to produce inconsistent numbers of young. You may have a year when you don't get many crappie, and maybe several years, 
and then for whatever reasons that are really not well explained, the population will explode and fill with very small, hungry crappie. And I think the biggest problem is those young crappie are feeding on the zooplankton that is necessary to fuel the, the growth of largemouth bass as well. So what you have is a population that can grow very quickly. They eat the same thing as your largemouth bass and simply outcompete largemouth bass. When we try to look into why they're so prolific in ponds and why they do better than largemouth bass, it's um, fairly easy to make some conclusions. First, there are two species of crappie. We have black crappie that have seven to eight dorsal spines, and then we have white crappie. White crappie are not suitable for stocking in ponds. Occasionally they're found in ponds, but they're even more problematic in a pond. But black crappie seems to be the species I find in most farm ponds, and they still can overpopulate. They begin spawning when the water temperature, or can begin spawning when the water temperature is as low as 55 degrees. Uh, Largemouth bass uh, don't begin spawning until the water temperature is about 60 degrees. So the crappie get a jump on when they start spawning. Uh, Then when those eggs hatch, and start to grow, what's the first thing out there available to eat? That's the largemouth bass spawn. Hmm. Largemouth bass will only lay about 4,000 eggs per pound of body weight. Black crappie can produce almost 200,000 eggs. So you have a species that starts earlier, has a capability of producing a lot more eggs each spawn, And they just simply take over and soon overpopulate in a pond. You end up with a pond that is overpopulated with two to three, maybe even four inch size crappie. And because you have so many crappie, do they ever size up normally to the point where you would want to harvest them? No, most of the time uh, they're going to stay in that stunted population. There will be several years with low growth. It takes a, a, something very dramatic to change that population structure in the farm pond. And what changes that population structure is trying to add additional largemouth bass to the pond that are already of an adequate size that can feed on those three inch crappie. Now, largemouth bass, it takes a pretty big largemouth bass to do that. Other folks have had some success by stocking hybrid stripers. Those seem to be uh, very efficient uh, at eating crappie. Even large catfish will eat crappie. So once you get a pond with an overpopulation of crappie, you've got to introduce some larger predator fish into the pond to try to feed on the crappie, Uh, do a good job of trying to fish and keep all of the crappie that you catch. Add some structure into the pond so that you can catch crappie later in the summer or even into the winter. So you're getting a year-round fishery. You've just got to remove as many crappie as you can. Once you get the population uh, lowered, then adequate numbers of largemouth bass should be able to help keep it in check. But frankly, most farm ponds that have both largemouth bass and crappie are very difficult to manage for most people. And in fact, it's a constant management, it sounds. There's no break. (laughs) It's a constant problem, uh, and and it's even worse in those ponds that don't have good clear water. Hmm. When you have less than about 15, 18 inches of visibility, it's difficult for bass, which are sight feeders, to find crappie. So that, again, gives the crappie those advantages in survival. So the message here is very clear. Crappie are not a good match for the farm pond environment, especially if you're maintaining other game fish in that pond. Go out to a larger impoundment where crappie are more accommodated and enjoy them that way, Charlie. Yeah, it's seldom that I recommend crappie in farm ponds, and I typically don't suggest them at all unless the pond is at least five acres in size. And that eliminates a lot of farm ponds that can provide excellent fisheries in Kansas, but usually you're not going to have trophy largemouth bass fishing and catch large-sized crappie in the same body of water. 
And those are the very compelling reasons to avoid stocking your farm pond with crappie. Charlie, we appreciate the word on this. Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension. He's Mike side with us every Tuesday right here. And again, as we wrap up today's broadcast, remember, if you're out of earshot of this Agriculture Today affiliate any given day, there are other ways to catch the broadcast. One via the live stream at ksre.ksu.edu. Click on the Agriculture Today Listen Live tab on the left side of that page. Then choose either the Mac or PC stream to listen. That's at ksre.ksu.edu. Or for listening later on at your leisure, go to this site to access the podcast, agtoday.net. You can click and listen to the podcast right there. And you can subscribe to that podcast via a number of platforms and have it downloaded free of charge to your mobile device automatically every day. The steps to do that right there at agtoday.net. N-E-T. Otherwise, please be back with us right here this same time tomorrow. Eric Atkinson here, thanking you for joining us for Agriculture Today over this, the K-State Radio Network.